Hi Daisy, thank you so much for coming and joining me on the Mary Just Meets podcast. Thank you so much, thank you for having me. I'm so glad that you could come on. I know you've been so busy recently with all of your projects that you've been doing online and collaborations, so thanks so much for sparing the time. Oh, of course, my pleasure. <laughs> I actually really wanted to ask you about one of your recent collaborations, which is Give Thanks, because mm. you had, not only is it an amazing song, uh, but you had so many musicians on there. It must have taken such a long time to write it and get everybody in, like, together and then put it all together. Like, how did that come about? Um, well, yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah, so that, that is, well, first of all, the song, I'd already written the song in terms of, it was a song I'd been, I'd been singing for a while now, and I actually released it back in um, November for Thanksgiving, because Give Thanks, it's a, it's a Thanksgiving song. Um, but actually, I, I just, I rewrote it for the current times, basically. So I had, I added an extra verse, um, especially to thank the NHS and the key workers who are working tirelessly at the moment, obviously trying to save lives and, and uh, putting themselves at risk. So I wanted to do a little thank you to them. And I thought that would be the perfect song to do it with and uh so but i wanted to write a special verse for it so i yeah and then i got um a bunch of friends who actually all of them have played the song with me um in different live gigs over the years so um so i had people from uh, america who i know and also from the uk and um so i had uh yeah lots of different instruments so like cello violin harp um drums uh, well percussion and double bass and piano and <laughs> And also the guitars and yeah, and lots of vocal harmonies and ukulele and like all the, all the works. So there's about a dozen, actually over a dozen people who have, have done uh, recording with me. So I just did a little, um, you know, ac not acapella, just like a, me solo with banjo and I sent it out to everybody and they put on their, um, their editions. And, and then uh, my long suffering boyfriend who happens to be a sound engineer, <laughs> put it all together and made it sound like it does. That's <laughs> so. handy, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. Wow, I'm slightly jealous that you've got somebody so handy right next to you in the house all the while. That would be thin. Oh my gosh. Very lucky. <laughs> yeah, well, you guys both did a great job on it and it sounds amazing. And um, you said you did it for Thanksgiving and I guess that's mm -hmm. because of your American roots. Yes, exactly. Yes. So I grew up American, with, aren't you? yes, I'm half yeah. American. My mother's American. So I grew up having Thanksgiving meals with, with family. So I, um, yeah, it was very much a part of my... Uh, my my childhood and I kind of wanted to and actually this song I talk about uh, family and my mother and, and so it's kind of a tribute to family really and to and to well everybody in your life really it's a kind of it's a bit of a it's not particularly specific to anybody in particular but it is about taking taking a moment to think about and be grateful for the things you have and the things you've had in your life and the, the, the loved ones. And also to think about those who are no longer there, but, but to feel grateful that you're there and you're alive. And, you know, it's, it's a gratitude song, basically. So yeah. I really like the sentiment of that. I feel like that would be quite a nice American tradition to adopt. Instead, we all seem to have adopted Black Friday and Cyber Monday instead so <laughs> corporations can make a bit of extra money. <laughs> That's true. And Super Bowl and, uh, and eating too much. And, and uh, yeah, it's become a holiday of, well, like Christmas has, it's become a holiday of more of a commerce thing than anything else. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I always liked the, the part of the, the meal where people, well, this was, not everybody does this, but where you, you take a moment and you thank and you, you say who you're thankful for, what you're thankful for. And I kind of liked that as a, as a thing to celebrate rather than all the other stuff that goes with <laughs> these holidays you know yeah well, that's really <laughs> lovely you hear of a lot of people doing gratitude journals or diaries mm. don't you i think yeah. more now than ever really with everything that's been going on and it does seem to help people a lot mm, definitely yeah. I, I, it helps me i i used to wake up and write three things i'm grateful for um you know actually sometimes i would do it before i went to bed instead and like you know just just having a you know having those moments where you think even just the, the act of thinking about it makes mm. apparently makes you much more positive and and uh, helps with your mental health basically so yeah yeah that's really good I've thought about doing that and then I haven't quite managed to have the, the discipline to like the commitment I mean I haven't done it a lot I've just done it a little bit I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm like you I, I have lots of intentions for these mm. things but actually um hard to keep up like regular practice with this stuff but but yeah. it's you know even if you just do it a little bit it's quite a nice thing to do and um sort of like meditation it's just kind of taking a moment um out of the day to to do something that's very much in the present moment i guess mm. um but you know i don't know I, I find um it's funny like um 
somebody asked me, how do you always smile so easily in photos? And stuff? Cause I always, I always, I don't, I'm, I, I find it, I, I don't usually, I'm not very good at pouting for one thing. <laughs> I'm much more of a smiler in photos and things than anything yeah. else. And somebody was like, how do you always like genuinely smile? And I'm like, well, I have so many things to smile about. Like I, I just think about something like a happy memory and, and that smile comes out and it's easy. You know, it's, if that makes any sense, that <laughs> sounds so cheesy, but... <laughs> it sounds like you could have given that advice to Chandler in Friends um, you know, when he's trying to get those pictures with Monica to announce their engagement and then he's constantly like like this at the camera that's right <laughs> oh my god he could have given that advice then I think I would have helped him out <laughs> yes that's true I hope you're a Friends well. fan too otherwise that would I be love fun. Friends yeah oh, no <laughs> reference Friends all you like we actually have a, a Trivial Pursuit category of just friends stuff and uh, we've been playing that in my flat with my so I'm here with with Chris who's um the aforementioned sound engineer boyfriend and also my brother and his girlfriend so there's four of us in this tiny little flat in London but we've been keeping ourselves occupied with games and you know group meals and stuff so but one of the things we've been doing is the friends trivial pursuit which has been fun right. amazing <laughs> I'd like I'd like to challenge you to a game of friends oh interesting okay <laughs> I'm up for that. <laughs> Test my friend's knowledge. <laughs> oh dear. No, I love that show. It's um, I've got it on my hard drive now, and it just means that whenever oh, wow. I'm traveling or stuck somewhere, I can just stick it on, and it takes you away. And absolutely. You know, well, that's a happy memory there for you, right? You just uh, yeah. <laughs> to, to make you happy, and, and yeah, that's true. Exactly. Smiling already. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. No, so it's brilliant. <laughs> Um, but going back to sort of your American roots, do you find that that does influence your music in quite a few different ways, your newer music? Yes, definitely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those who know, uh, those who know my kind of history um, and those who don't, you know, I may as well just do a quick little recap of what I've, what kind of genres I suppose I've been involved <laughs> in over the years and still am, um, you know, um, I, I, my first thing before I, I am um, actually the first thing I ever did was, was being, I was in a musical when I was nine years old. <laughs> I'm oh, not going to do the full story, but I, I was in Les Mis and I, I sang as little Cosette. And what, then, the actual um, Les Mis on the... On, well, yeah, like it was a Cameron Macintosh tour. What? And That's amazing! <laughs> it was up in Scotland because they, each, each, um, each city had uh, local children because it made more sense and you know and so so I auditioned for the one in Edinburgh where I grew up and um yeah I was one of one of three cassettes because they you know interchanged them because obviously you can't get them to work every night because you know <laughs> child labor and no, I don't know <laughs> no there's there's a lot of rules about this stuff but the um although I'm sure I don't know exactly how it works so I know that like Matilda and other you know and I, I've I, I'm not no expert on it, but I, I you know, that was my first ever gig, I guess. And that was when I was nine. But yeah, but so cool. then <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. And I, I, I love musicals and, and I'm doing, I'm involved in that kind of thing again, actually recently, which is quite fun. But oh, cool. yeah, but well, well, not in Les Mis specifically, but in, um, I, you know, with, with the, the gig theatre show that I've been working on, uh, Coven, uh, yes. that is, that is like a, a recent foray for me, uh, something that I've been creating for the past year or so with uh, a fellow uh, singer and writer who's more in the act, in the actor world rather than the music world. Like, so she's, she's work, she does a lot of theatre and lots of, mm-hmm. you know, TV, I don't know, blah, 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 lots of stuff like that. And she's, um, she approached me because she'd come to some of my gigs and said she wanted to write um, something together that was kind of not the usual musical sort of more of a uh, gig thing so we kind of made this gig theater musical basically um, oh. and the the topic that we were interested in at the time and still am uh, it was uh, witch trials of like the 16th and 17th century because it's kind wow. of an amazing time or not amazing that sounds you know but uh, uh, I'm not sure amazing I can't think of the right word an, an interesting time an interesting time to study and and so we made the show that was you know so you know songs that were inspired by that by by their stories and then also we kind of found songs of the time and we kind of reimagined them and rewrote lyrics and and uh, also so we, we kind of made the show that's kind of part storytelling part ted talk part like gig basically wow. really so yeah, it's, it was re- it's been really fun and we're doing quite a lot more. Um, well, we, were, we were planning on doing quite a lot more this year. We're going to do an Edinburgh Fringe show originally and then uh, oh, wow. it's been cancelled. And yeah, we had plans to do other festival appearances and um, we have we have some other future plans that um, that 
hopefully will happen at some point. So there'll be more, but we, um, but in the meantime, we're doing lots of videos and things remotely and continuing to write together. So, yeah. so yeah, the, the, that's the Fringe Festival though, like that's a yeah. massive deal. That's a huge opportunity. And then I guess it's just been yeah. cancelled and I know. And we had a great slot. We had like a 9 PM underbelly. I shouldn't probably say that publicly. Oh, it doesn't matter. Whatever. <laughs> anyway, we had a great slot and, um, it's a shame we can't, I can't use it. We can't use it, but hopefully we'll, oh, we'll get to go back next year and, and do it then or, or figure mm. out another future for it. But, but in the meantime, it's been, um, uh, yeah, that, that's sort of, yeah. So it's kind of interesting to go. From, that was my very early, the first ever gig was when I was nine, you know, doing a musical. And now quite recently I've gone back into that world of, of theater and music combining in some way anyway. So I've enjoyed that very much. So, yeah, um, but yeah, in between that though, like, you know, so I obviously, you know me from the classical crossover world because I, I was in All Angels, the, um, what was really yeah. talking about, a bit more about, um, well, maybe, maybe we can do it now or maybe later, but uh, <laughs> before that though, I did a jazz album and- uh, well, Before All Angels, you did a jazz yes. album. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So my, my kind of trajectory, I suppose, looks like, nine years old I was in Les Mis doing and then did a bunch of musical stuff and that kind of thing and a few talent contests I was in Stars in the Rise for instance oh. as, a, as a 13 year old um I think I was the youngest ever contestant or something really? uh, this is like I was um oh I'm curious to see if you can guess who I would be oh gosh um, no I'm that's quite hard like <laughs> don't worry I was Judy Garland Oh so, wow! Yeah, that was quite fun, and um, and then Good after that, um, well, I mean, it was uh, at the time I was like, I had an insanely kind of big vibrato for a kid, and of course, Judy Garland is known for her like vibrato as well as you know, <laughs> lots of other things. But um, so I guess it kind of made sense in a way. But um, but yeah, anyway, so that was uh, that was what kind of happened next, and you know, obviously, I was still studying at school, and I went to music schools. In, in secondary school so I was like I was training as a chorister in, up in Edinburgh then I moved down to London to go to music school uh, in North London mm. but um but between those times I did this jazz album when I was 15 and then I um <laughs> and then actually that was the reason why I ended up getting into All Angels because um Hi. I I so I had this album and I my school um up in Scotland we we got into the BBC what was it BBC the school proms at the Albert Hall. And so like all those schools were invited to perform, right? And it was part of this festival. And so we went through all these audition process and then we got, we ended up being chosen to be one of the schools to get to perform at the Albert Hall, which was amazing. So so then when when we went down there, I uh, my mum made sure I packed some of these jazz CDs in my suitcase. <laughs> and so I had these CDs and I was like, oh, mom, I'm not gonna give them to anybody. And she's like, <laughs> You have to my mom's american and she's very good at this stuff she's very good at like the promotional stuff you know brilliant and uh, putting people forward in that way and so i was like okay and, and so i spent like about half an hour pacing like i don't know if you know that albert hall like circular kind of like around the stage like you know so just pacing pacing all the way through that like nervously holding these like cds and thinking you know hoping no, none of my school friends saw me doing this and then eventually <laughs> I, I built up the courage to knock on howard goodall's door because he was presenting he was one of the wow. presenters um and also richard stilgo's door and so i knocked on their doors and i gave them the cd the cd and uh <laughs> i don't know i mean had i not done that none of none of all angels stuff would have happened for me and, and he's basically really? he then he then stayed in touch and he got me to sing some stuff for him on his like various um, uh, music documentaries and things. And then he, um, then he put me forward or like recommended me to Universal when they were, you know, they were looking for singers for All Angels. And they, well, they didn't know yet what it was going to be called, but they, were, they wanted to do a classical crossover group that was sort of similar to G4, but a female version and or Il Devo, you know, you know and they were kind of looking for, yeah, for teenage, you know, schoolgirls basically who were choristers or had you know who could sing classically and um and so uh yeah that's so then he put me forward and that was how I got the audition basically so it was all through that oh. little moment where I I plucked up the courage and knocked on the door and you know but anyway so I'm that's brilliant <laughs> sorry that's it's a really so like long-winded so story though. this is like when I go and talk at schools this is exactly what I'm trying to get the kids to do 
Mm. It's so important. And it's, it's just amazing that you made the most of that opportunity. Like that's one of yeah. my mottos. Um, yeah. Because when I was growing up, my grandmother, she gave me my first motto, which was to make mm. sure you all ha always have more than one string to your bow. So you've got like mm. a backup. Um, and then my mum said to make the most of every single opportunity. So you made the most of that opportunity of going to the Royal Albert Hall, giving your albums out to anybody that you could. That's so mm. important that you had the courage to do that because it takes a lot of guts to do that. It's really scary yeah. to put yourself out there. So that's Absolutely. brilliant. This is exactly what I'm trying to encourage <laughs> to do whenever I talk to them. Oh, good. Well, oh, I'm glad that, yeah, no, that's some really good advice you got from your, you know, your grandmother and your mother. They obviously have their heads screwed on. <laughs> they do. They do. They yeah. Do yeah, absolutely. And um, I just think it's great that you were able to do that. I can't, like, what was the phone call like when they were like, oh, by the way, we want you to audition at Universal? Well, I mean, I, well, I, I don't know. It was weird. I, I didn't really kind of understand the not the gravity that sounds like it's serious and dangerous but um, I just didn't know the the normity of that opportunity I suppose at the time not, none of us did really because we were you know we had hardly any life experience and it didn't seem you know that un implausible that, that that would happen you know like obviously now I, I reflect and I'm like wow that was such a w once in a lifetime thing to have happen and and um yeah but at the time it was like you know I was I was like, wow, it was, it was, I was, I mean, the audition was kind of funny. I mean, <laughs> the, um, I think by this point they'd already chosen, I think the other three girls. Um, wow. so they were looking for the final one basically. So it was one of those kind of, you know, uh, I think I was like the last audition. So they were quite quick about deciding. And so it was, it was quite funny. Really? Cause I would have thought it would have been more difficult because they're looking for somebody who can match three people then. They're well, not, yeah. You know what I mean? Maybe. That's like a more difficult decision trying to find somebody whose voice matches all the other three. You've got yes, to... possibly. Yeah. Although, I mean, I think that, you know, we didn't ever like audition in the same room. And so like in terms of blend, it was kind of, it was, you know, it was always going to be a bit of a guess. A, a guess really? Oh, you, right. Oh, that's interesting. It. Yeah. So like we, you know, we didn't know each other before any of this. And then we were, once we had been chosen for it, then we were, then we met and then we sang together and, you know, then it, everything else happened. But I suppose because we were quite young and still very much learning and flexible, we were, you know, we kind of, we learnt together a little bit and we blended together through that process of, of being young and learning, you know, so I suppose that had, how yeah. great you were at that age that they were just like so quick with their decision. Like, yeah, we want you straight away. Well, yeah. I mean, I maybe they decided in it even in advance because it was like, you know, they'd heard, they, they had heard that I'd done this jazz album and I think they'd heard recordings. And so they, they kind of had a, they knew, but it's funny because like the jazz album is so different to, the classical crossover stuff that it was like but you know because I'd had the course to experience in the classical training I guess I guess that's the sort of the perfect thing for them you know because it was obviously classical crossover is yeah you have classical training but also being able to interpret and sing music that's not in the classical repertoire as well and being able to have you know a, a flexible versatile voice right they can do a few different genres which is what we were talking about before so I suppose that was a good sign for them but yeah no I mean the um it was a bit the audition itself was like I, I remember turning up to it was so it was a manager and a and somebody from the from Universal they they uh, had thought of the idea together so I was at the manager's house and I remember turning up and and I they had this kind of quite small keyboard and there's uh, somebody playing the piano and I brought this music and they wanted to hear something classical and something non-classical so I I did Fly Me to the Moon um <laughs> which is the song I you know I've just felt very comfortable doing it was one of the first jazz songs I, I sang mm -hmm. and then I did um Silent Noon which was by Vaughan Williams and nice. um uh, it was a really beautiful piece and uh but the the <laughs> the poor piano player like he had this tiny keyboard and this then this piece is like you know spans like four or five octaves you know <laughs> and he was trying to like he just he didn't have enough piano to play it you know and so anyways we we tried doing this song and we kind of got through like half of it or something and they were like okay that, that's cool thank you that's great and I you know I, I didn't know whether I'd done you know I, actually I remember one thing in the middle it's quite funny there was a um <laughs> that um the manager had a cat and um the cat actually um, in the middle of one of the songs started throwing up in the living room. <laughs> it was just like, and I just kind of kept going as you do, right? And it was just like all these like things that just kept on going wrong. And I was just like, oh God, this is going terribly. Oh no. So I just didn't think it was like I was doing, you know, doing a good job of this. And then, um, but then like after the audition, you know, the singing part, then I was taken to this other room, the office and basically sat down and said, okay, so now that you're in this group and I was like, what? 
what that wow. and, and what that just like that and I just was so surprised that it, anyway so that was um that was how the audition went <laughs> great <laughs> it, was, it was it was like a, well, yeah so it was super you? quick not so much for the cat like no I know I, I think the cat right. was fine I think the cat <laughs> was fine in the end but must, must have eaten something or had a fur ball or something but, oh man oh, that no. was a, a stressful audition should we say <laughs> But yeah. So yeah. So uh, I know this was a really long-winded. I told you I'd go on tangents today. Um, you asked me. And I was happy about that though. I like tangents. You never know quite where they're going to go. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, no. So you were asking originally about um, music that has inspired me recently, and you said that you know America has inspired me. You know, has it inspired me more recently? And and mm. actually, yes. That the long that was a really long way to get to the to the point. But basically, after the classical crossover album albums with uh, All Angels. I um I kind of started to revisit my love of like of folk music and and writing, and I started doing my own my own gigs um as a as a singer songwriter and but you know very sporadically and then I actually I was part of a band for a while and we would write and play gigs together and so and that was a sort of very different like sidestep for me in terms of genre because I'd been singing with orchestra singing Mozart and you know I don't know whatever you know I can't think of any other composers right now I don't know what's wrong with me um, you know but just like you know classical repertoire and then and like at Albert Hall and you know these big shows and then um then going into like the pub world and like singing to like hardly anybody listening singing original songs and like being in a band and it was like this is, it was very different and it was quite it was quite a shock but it was it was good though I, I basically I'd, I'd always wanted to have that that initial experience of like kind of growing something um because yeah, I mean we, we couldn't have our first ever gig was at Kedugan Hall and the second gig was at Albert Hall and like there's all angels you know so we were That's very much amazing. like thrown in at these like massive places and so it was kind of like deep end yeah the deep end and then um, <laughs> you know like no kind of warm-ups to kind of get to that point so but you know, so I kind of longed for those those gigs that were like you know nobody listening and like sticky floors and you know I longed for those kind of like normal music experiences you get when you're building something and you're an independent artist and and I and you know I, I got it for the first time at the age of you know I don't know how old I was like 23 or something that I first actually did a proper like pub gig where like you know after after having done all these massive gigs and for thousands of people and televised you know so it was it was a weird experience but I, I really wanted I really liked that actually I enjoyed going back to you know starting from scratch a little bit like that and having a kind of clean slate and trying out things in a, in a less um I don't know less pressured environment as well like having to be, you know be perfect for the Albert Hall like you know it's quite hard you know like not that we were perfect but you know like but you obviously there's a lot of pressure a lot of people watching and then uh you know whereas you're in your pub you know like, it doesn't matter if you make a mistake or you forget the words a little you know because you know it's a pub and people are more forgiving Although in some ways, you know, the, these intimate gigs are less forgiving because, you know, people do see and hear everything a lot more. <laughs> so, but yeah, anyway, so that that's, um, that is, uh, yeah. So the, the America in, in, uh, influence has come recently because I've been with the folk music kind of resurgence for me. I've, uh, I've explored a lot of uh, folk music from Scotland where I grew up, but also America where my mother's from and where a lot of my family are from. So I've, I've re, and I've, you know, I've taken up the banjo which is obviously associated a lot with country music and Americana and so I've um I've been delving a lot more into Americana world and loving all that stuff really and, and you know I grew up listening to a lot of that thing those those genres anyway but I just didn't really have any you know I didn't have an outlet for, for me as an artist yet until until recently so so that's been that's been cool to kind of go into that world a bit more mm. um yeah is that mainly what you're focusing on now then is probably more the banjo slight americana type kind of music is that where you feel yourself heading in as an artist in your own right mm. and your own name yeah i think so um, folk americana is kind of how i describe my music these days um and i suppose so obviously with uh so i did a jazz album when i was 15 then i did three albums with all angels after that and an ep and that was classical crossover and mm my actual debut album as a singer songwriter is going to be you know folk americana so <laughs> the full gamut of different genres but well not the full gamut i'm not like rapping or something but <laughs> <laughs> now that i want to see <laughs> next next album you'll see <laughs> um but you know it's it's kind of um 
you know, actually as a songwriter, I think this is where my heart is more is, is in the folk and Americana world, the kind of story songs, the, um, the acoustic instruments, uh, kind of intimate, that you know, those kinds of, you know, emotional songs, I suppose. I mean, I've always loved that anyway. And, and it wasn't like you can't do that with jazz and classical crossover, but I think I found it as, as a songwriter, it didn't seem like there was much room in the classical crossover world for that. I don't know, maybe you can, maybe you have a, a counter argument to that, but it didn't feel like, at least with the record company, they, they were interested in, in famous songs rather than in original songs for the most part, because that's, that's what people knew and loved and, and would buy that, from their experience. Mm. And, and then same with the jazz world, it felt like it was all about standards and about the greats. So you're kind of tributing always the, the older writers rather than, well, I mean, I know that's not true. A lot of, a lot of people are writing the original jazz as well, but it felt at least in the environment I was in, it felt like it was quite restrictive as in terms of songwriting and like I, that I wouldn't necessarily have the same, the same kind of audience for, for my own songwriting in that world. And so, um, I don't know, as a genre, it made, it made so much more sense, the folk genre, because there's so many more people writing music and, and obviously there's a lot of traditional music and folk music as well. But, um, but yeah, it felt like more of a welcoming to, to songwriting world. And so I suppose it kind of felt natural to, to go to that as a songwriter. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Everything you said there just makes complete sense to me of what I've experienced as well. Right. Um, and I do completely understand what you're saying that the folk and Americana kind of side would, I guess, would feel more free from mm. a creative standpoint. I think maybe because you've got so many amazing places within America that original music comes from. I mean, Nashville mm. is the one that you think of straight away, but then yeah. it just shows the freedom that you've got for songwriting there and for innovation within those genres. Yes. And I do know what you're saying about classical crossover because when I was first signed to Decca, I, um, I had lots of people saying to me, don't just do another UCJ songbook album. Um, so UCJ, Universal Classics and Jazz. I had lots yeah. of people saying that to me. Um, and so then at the age of 19, I was then saying to Decca, oh, I don't want to do another songbook album, even though I don't think I actually knew what that meant at the time. <laughs> I was just <laughs> going on what people said to me. Right. Um, and then that's how I ended up with Shine, where I co-wrote mm. um, seven out of the 12 tracks for that Amazing. album. Amazing, yeah. Mm. Of, new material um which i absolutely loved doing and i loved creating and i think it's important for classical crossover people to continue to innovate within the genre in order yeah. for it to expand um otherwise you've got even though they're You're treading water but right a lot more recordings of ave maria um mm. and i can't say anything because i've recorded ave maria for <laughs> No, no, I know. And me too. Like everybody has, well, not everybody, but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's quite common to, to do that. But I think it's great that you're also doing the songwriting as part of it, because that was one thing I, I noticed that wasn't, that was kind of missing. in at least the time that we were doing, it was, was like a lot of, there were, there were very few people doing like predominantly original classical crossover music. And I was just like, this seems weird to me that like, we're just doing the same songs and like, they're not even that different. Like you may as well just like borrow our arrangement because it's you know, like what's one, one, you know, version of the prayer isn't that much different to another. And, you know, uh, there's, there's very little you can do to really innovate apart from with arrangement, I suppose, you know, like we would, as all angels, we were trying to change arrangements quite drastically so that, you know, so that we were doing something different with the, the pieces that were familiar, at least with four of us singing harmonies, you could do something with, with that, which is good. Yeah. But, but, but in general, it was, um, it felt a little restrictive in terms of, um, in terms of, yeah, the songwriting and, and I don't, I don't, the other members of the group didn't really have much interest in songwriting. So I was kind of a frustrated songwriter in that world thinking, you know, well, I, I was writing, but I just wasn't writing for the group. I was just writing for my own, my own, you know, enjoyment and my own expression, but, yeah. but it didn't feel like there was an option for us as a group to write and to do that. So mm. I don't know, it, for me, it was always, that was always a, a point of frustration um, was, was the kind of lack of, lack of opportunity to express myself as a songwriter in that world but as i'm i'm glad that 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 you did and i think that that's so important that you did and, and it's so it's so refreshing because you know as you said like there were so many so many people who were doing the same old things but you know yeah but you were saying yeah there pros and cons. People, yeah it's different sides of each that of each of that because a lot of people were happy that there was innovation within the genre mm. um but then the audience of classical crossover do tend to like what they know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the and thing, I, I guess. We're all guilty yeah. of that, really. 
Mm. Um, so yeah, whereas I think that maybe in Americana or more with the American side, um, like using Nashville as the best example mm. again, people are always waiting to hear the next great song. Yeah, mm-hmm. want to hear that next innovation. But I think that's probably why when you're talking about your arrangements, um, why your music fitted so well in the reunion gig that you did with All Angels. Mm, it really, it. it really fitted in so beautifully because I love storytelling. I really mm. love that in songs, and. Um, I really loved the uh, arrangement uh, particular, which went, oh, what's the song? Mm, what'd you say? Oh, hide and seek, yeah. Yes! <laughs> I'm so glad. That was one of my arrangements, yeah. We didn't ever record that one because we just, um, we did it for a, a concert, but we didn't ever actually do a proper recording because, you know, no at that point we, we weren't recording. That. that arrangement was, the, oh, it was stunning. Oh, I thank you so much. It. Oh, I'm so glad. Well, I mean, hey, we actually, we, well, I, I'm not going to announce it yet because I, I don't want to do it until we have a proper confirmation, but we might do something uh, like a little video together uh, during this lockdown time. But, but that's, that's what my cogs are turning, but I'm also trying to figure out how I can fit this in with all the millions of yeah. things I've agreed to. You know, you know, you're the same, you know, exactly. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how, when I can have like a, a day off because like every day I'm just doing so much stuff. What's the day off? Yeah, I know, right? What does that even mean? <laughs> I know. Oh, I've never, I suppose I never have a day off anyway, even if I, you know, even, even without it. lockdown. But, like, sometimes yeah. I do envy people. I don't think I'd be able to stick a nine to five. Like, I don't think I'd be very good. But sometimes I do envy people who have one because you clock off mm. and then you're done. Yeah. Whereas mm-hmm. for me, my brain won't switch off. Yeah, even if you're not like actively doing something, you're still thinking of songs, like, song ideas or like to-do lists or, you know, oh, that email I didn't send or that, you know, whatever it might be. And, um, or just like, you know, trying to reply to people on social media, which happens basically all the waking hours, right? It doesn't matter whether it's 11 o'clock at night or, you know, or whatever it might be. And so, and like, because also people are, are writing in from all over the world. And so, you know, different time zones and yeah, it's it's a little bit overwhelming to do all of that, I guess, all the time. So I've I've certainly felt a little bit of a little bit frazzled recently from the social media kind of um, well, just the, the the I don't know, just the amount of social media stuff that's going on right now. And like obviously, I'm you know I'm grateful for it too because it's like well, this is a way we can communicate and a way we can still kind of perform even if it's not in a, a traditional concert way. Like at least we can still connect with fans and you know but actually being able to do that all the time is is I don't know, it's quite a lot of pressure and a lot of stress that sometimes it builds up from that so I, I, yeah. I'm just trying to take it slow and manage that and like you know just sometimes have days where I'm not necessarily on my phone replying to people and uh just like at the, at the piano and doing a bit of writing and playing and you know yeah. doing other things that you want to do like whether you know for you like doing some crafts as well like it's you know actually pursuing hobbies instead of always you know always uh being on social media anyway yeah that, well, yeah, that, that's me, my recent my experience sewing at the moment i've got my dresses that i am quite happy to focus on do you have any other kind of things like that that you're focusing on then that's not musical mm. When you have the time, but I'm surprised <laughs> if you have any of the time. <laughs> I, no, I don't really that much, but I guess the things that I do, well, uh, the things I used to do a bit more when before lockdown were kind of a bit more, you know, I, I love, I love socializing. I love hanging out with friends basically. So anything that was sort of group activities like that, I guess. But, um, and I, you know, I used to go climbing a bit and sometimes like, um, really like rock well, climbing. Yeah, rock climbing, obviously I can't do that now, but so I'm just like totally not getting enough exercise really, but I'm, but I I love um, playing games actually. I love like board games and that kind of thing. So I've been doing a bit of that with um, with my flatmates, you know, Um, or actually online as well, like with friends, we're doing like online games and that kind of thing. So that's been kind of, um, that's been nice to kind of switch off with that. So yeah. And to try to be a bit more sociable as well. So you're not Mm. feeling lonely, lost in your yeah. little world that won't switch off <laughs> yeah. like. but I can't believe you said rock climbing that was my first ever proper job really yeah I worked yeah. my Saturday job um it started as a Saturday job working at the rock climbing center in Gloucester wow um, that's so cool so you're like a climber as well then oh well, yeah wow well, yeah I haven't done it for a while <laughs> oh god I'm, I'm not really good at it I just I quite enjoy it I'm just not very good at it yeah it's really I did I did really enjoy it and I was fully qualified um lead climber by the end of it as well um I can't remember how to do it anymore um I'm sure you would before this 
stuff started, I said to Rachel, we should go to the one in Exeter because we're not more near there at the moment um, and actually start climbing again because I've never really liked exercise. <laughs> That's me like too. a massive understatement. <laughs> oh, me, me too. I like everybody going on these jogs and stuff. I'm like, ah, no, uh, if there's anything else I could do, I would do it. But basically I like that rock climbing is, is like exercise. that doesn't feel like exercise, right? Exactly. Because it's, because you have, you have another thing in your mind. You're thinking, oh, how do I get to the top? It's like a problem solving exercise rather than like, you know, just walking on a treadmill or running on a treadmill or something. Like I find that to be very boring as well. So things that have like, like goals and kind of like immediate like I don't know like something that engages your brain as well not just your body I don't I, I find that that helps me a lot when I'm exercising and it's got Otherwise, a positive reinforcement up. because you keep getting closer yeah. to the top or you do something yes. that you couldn't do before and yeah. yeah I completely know what you're saying I mean for um lockdown I've got a um a thing with my mum that we're doing <laughs> so oh. she's in Texas now yeah. um so her eight o'clock is our two o'clock um, so she's been waking up in the morning and doing an um, exercise video online with me oh. every day at two o'clock UK time. Oh, wow. Um, cool. I think I'm going to be coming out of lockdown probably the fittest I've ever been. <laughs> wow. Oh, God, I'm so impressed. I'm like the opposite. I've just been like, I've spent, been spending so much time cooking, like, and like I've been getting into like cooking really like. I don't know, very indulgent meals and like desserts and things and like all and like basically the opposite of that. So like, I've not oh, done wow. enough exercise. So like last night I made like this Indian curry and like <gasps> then we had like these lemon posset desserts and like you know, I've been just getting into like all of that stuff and instead of like getting into exercise. I think oh, I need right. to like, when can I come around? That sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well it's a good job I've been exercising because I'm sat here with um some chocolate biscuits next to me in the oh, <laughs> can you pass this one yeah I'll pass one through the thing they go that's for you <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it, but if I wasn't doing it with my mum I'd be so lazy yeah I don't think I'd actually do it so um it's a good I think it's, it's good with. having a partner in that yeah because like, I actually did do one exercise class here a few weeks ago and um I roped in Chris to do it with me and he got so um he, he was so disheartened by it because he was like oh I'm so unfit oh, that like it just never happened again and we were so sore for the next like three days we just like were walking around like like I don't know just so <laughs> stiff with like the <laughs> sore muscles yeah. and so I just like put off from it and like now I have nobody who would want to do it with me so I have to like oh, I know that sounds so sad that. doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah me, you, I don't think she's really into that kind of thing <laughs> we'll keep you on track no that's actually good when your muscles um are aching because then your body is uh, like fixing them yeah exactly um, that's, that's, like, that's a good sign calories like days afterwards yeah because your body's repairing the muscles so i had to say that to mum she was like oh but i'm aching <laughs> so but that's actually a good thing yeah, yeah that's true that's a good sign that you're doing the right kind of exercises i guess so and yeah. pushing yourself yeah. It's really funny though, because we've got um, a gym in the house. Now, when I say that, it sounds a lot posher than it is. It's not. <laughs> we bought this house because the dining room was just about big enough to fit Rich's squat rack into it. Right. Wow. So instead of a table in our dining room, we have a power cage. <laughs> That's, that's dedication wow and rich is always moaning at me like before this he was always moaning at me just going we've got a gym in the house and you <laughs> never use it <laughs> never use it. Um, uh, and then throughout all of lockdown like doing this with my mum i've then sort of started leaving some workout stuff in the gym and he came up to me and he said i love that you're using the gym but there's a lot of stuff in the gym can we kind of tidy the gym and it was really funny because he was like constantly moaning me to use it and now i'm using yeah. it getting annoyed <laughs> that's it <laughs> you I'm can't like, win basically <laughs> oh, oh dear, dear. It's, good. it's good though i've been enjoying like being able to talk to my mum every day while i'm doing it too yeah that's really, that's a nice little tradition as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's really nice oh. she's been writing quite a few songs during this oh, i didn't realize she also writes yeah, she started recently. She's um, now really found her niche. She's a rockabilly artist now. Oh, wow. Um, That's so cool. She, she is really cool. <laughs> Not That's that amazing. Bad, really cool. <laughs> um, she looks the part and everything because she's got tattoos all over. Wow. Um, plays upright double bass and then um, sings I love that. 
I, I really that. want to learn that instrument so much. I played it once at a gig, actually maybe twice, but yeah, really? I, yeah, well just, well not like properly, just like I, I basically I swapped with my bass player just for a bit of fun. So he played my guitar and I played his bass for a song. Uh, you know, it was a song that was easy enough to play. Like I just had to play three notes on the bass. And so, you know, but even still I was like, oh, this is pretty hard. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'd love the bass. I'd love to learn it properly. Um, How many and I have like play then? Because you've got so many behind you that I can see. There's loads on the piano that you sat next to. And... Yeah, but I, they're all kind of on this wall. It's quite, kind of hard to see them distinctly, but basically I have, well, I've got various guitars and then yeah. things that are like that. So banjo ukulele mandolin and i have like the kind of hybrid instruments i have like a banjo lele and a banjo lin so <laughs> you have all the all the variations and then of course piano and um i don't know uh I'm trying to think what else i play i mean just like kind of toy instruments like glockenspiel and melodica and that kind of stuff and percussiony <laughs> things but like i um yeah no i mean mostly it's just piano and guitar based instruments that i can you know, mostly for songwriting and accompanying singing. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say like, I'm, I'm not like the best solo or something. I can't like do amazing, like electric guitar solo or something. I'm, I'm more, I, I can do the chords basically and some finger picking, that kind of thing. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, I love instruments. I love learning new ones. Like that's, yeah. I, if I could fit a double bass in here, I would basically. <laughs> <laughs> um. that's really cool. Well, it sounds like you'd be able to pick it up really quickly. It's, I really oh, I admire know. multi-instrumentalists such as yourself and like being able to sing and then do all the arrangements as well. That's just so clever. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I mean, I owe it to the, you know, schooling really, I guess, cause I, I, uh, you know, I had, I was very lucky to have had, um, you know, to, to go to the music school that I did and, and to have the tuition that I did. Cause you know, the teachers there are just incredible. So I, I, um, yeah, I was always exposed to a lot of amazing tuition and inspiration. Like, and my fellow students, you know, they were they were as much of an inspiration as the teachers were. Because like, the people in my years at these like music schools were just insanely talented and brilliant people. And I was like, I was very much on the lower end of that. Like, oh, I, I, I was that. constant. I mean, <laughs> like the, they were winning competitions left, right, and center. And they would, I'm just like, oh, I I can't even. I don't know how to describe how good they were, but. But anyway, I, I was like, when I got into the music school, I was like, really? You sure? Like, I, I feel like I don't, I'm not good enough to be here. But, you know, anyway, I, I was just feel like that sometimes, though, don't they? We've all got definitely. that imposter syndrome. Yes. Yeah, always. And Does it ever go away? Going, but you're amazing. And you performed in the Royal Albert Hall and all, those jobs <laughs> and did all those cool things. It's because you're great. <laughs> well, I guess it's, yeah, I don't know. It's funny because you kind of think, I guess you convince yourself that, you know, it's luck because it's, I don't know, yeah. it, it makes it easier if, if you don't do well, if it, if it was because of luck rather than because of skill. Do you know what I mean? I it's like kind of like, it's a, it's a cushioning for a potential failure <laughs> is to kind of like, is to kind of undermine the, the amount that, that that is based on skill rather than luck those opportunities you know because you know you get those those great opportunities and you think about all the people who are also you know who could be there and who are great but who aren't and you think well you know this is to do with luck is to do rather than skill because actually I know uh, you know I can name however many hundreds of people who I, I can think of who could easily be in that position and who are great and who could entertain everybody and you know and be wonderful and, and I feel like yeah so I don't know there's, there's a kind of it's partly it's partly self-preservational that I, I think that way that I'm like you know that it's kind of you know focusing on the fact that, that that there's a lot of luck element involved but it's also just aware just the just awareness of all the amazing talent that isn't being recognized and old and and wondering why that is and how you know I don't know how that is I, I do kind of understand what you're saying but I do I'm sort of I'm, then, I'm not really being clear sorry I'm kind of going around in a few different points there but yeah no I, I get what you're saying um but it does all remind me of a quote that I saw on a card once which was luck is being prepared for opportunity when it comes mm. and I think a lot of the times we are landed with opportunities mm. um but then more often it's opportunities that we create for ourselves mm. and those are the really important ones as well because you've had to be so brave to get to that point of giving yourself that opportunity not only for not only because you've got to be or try and be confident in your own ability but because it's difficult to put yourself out there it's what we were saying earlier about how great it was that you gave your cd to those people that's just yeah. so brilliant you created that opportunity for yourself mm. and that is hard but then you made the most of that opportunity when it came you were prepared for it yeah true. so it's 
it's just brilliant that you had that courage to do that. And then obviously you were prepared for that opportunity when it came because yeah. you are skilled and amazing at what you do. <laughs> and yeah, and I, yeah, I think you're right. It has to be both. It can't be just one or the other. And, and yeah, you can't, it can't just be lucky, but not have anything to then, you know, no goods to show for it kind of thing, you know, but, <laughs> and vice versa. You can't just be good and never kind of, um, yeah, never kind of have those opportunities. I, well, I don't know if that makes any sense. That doesn't. I'm, 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 I'm also making. I'm. Just, I don't know. I'm. I'm still kind of figuring out what I even think about this stuff because. I don't know. I have like this book called Talent is Overrated and uh, I haven't even read it yet, but, Sounds <laughs> but I, I, I like the idea of it, of the kind of idea that it's not just based on talent. You know, this, this you know, it's kind of, it's so complicated, I guess. It's like mm. a, a formula that you can't, you can't really put together because it's, yeah. it's, and it shouldn't be, I guess that way, but I don't know if people are, I guess are always desperate to try and find theory and try and find like some sort of one size fits all thing that will, mm. that will work. But doesn't. I don't know. I suppose, I mean, one thing I've, I've kind of realized about, you know, like you kind of get told different advice over the years and I was always told to like focus and be and do one thing and just focus on doing that well. And I found as a natural rebel, <laughs> I have not done that. And I found actually <laughs> that to be a more fulfilling life for me so far anyway, like knock on wood, I don't know. I feel like mostly because I think you should follow what you enjoy doing more than what people say is the right thing to do because I've, I've always enjoyed doing lots of different things whether it's different genres or different instruments or you know different projects and collaborations like I've enjoyed I've enjoyed that so much that I, I I could not do it even though I was advised to like focus and so but I've somehow found some success through that because I think because it's something I've enjoyed and because I've stuck with it mm. I've found my little pockets of of people and, and communities and and success through doing those different projects and, I, and it's really random for, for an outside eye to look at all the different projects I do whether it's the jazz albums or the classical crossover albums or the folk Americana or then going into the other territories of like witch musicals and <laughs> another kind of like a female collective called the Herd Collective and we, we promote women in the arts and so like there's a feminist stuff going on there I mean there, I have so many different projects and that's not even all of them that's just like <laughs> a few um that it's kind of you know I do session stuff with film and tv you know like I for some people that's what how they see me and they don't see the artist stuff you know and so it's kind of you know I I don't know I I, I guess just maybe the advice I would give anybody is to just enjoy not that it was asked <laughs> but you know just to just to kind of find what you enjoy and then you'll find success through that because <laughs> you know Mm. I don't know. I think pe people sort of see it when you, people can tell when it's something authentically that you enjoy. Yes. And I think if you're faking it, then, then it won't ever last basically. No. And it's very easy for people to see that now with social media. It's even easier yeah. for people to see when it doesn't actually mean something to you. Whereas mm. when you're creating something that is from the depths of your heart and bringing it out to people, even though it's more scary to show people mm. that creation, that's what always I've found has resonated more yeah when I put something like that out so yeah I do completely know what you're mm. saying um but I really want to touch on what you said mm. about helping other female artists because mm. it's like what you were saying earlier um where you feel like some people are so great and yet they don't get that limelight that you feel they deserve and it sounds yeah. like that's a really nice way of bringing people out and giving them a stage and giving them an audience so Absolutely. could you tell me more about that yeah, totally. Yeah. So, well, so this is a collective I started with another artist, Carrie Ann, who um, is the one playing harp on the Give Thanks video. So she and I um, met actually in a session. So we both do session world stuff. So um, we met singing, singing backing vocals for Radiohead, as you do. What? <laughs> in, in, a, in the album that they did a few years ago. That's so that's where we met. Cool. <laughs> Which is like quite a cool origin story. I like to, <laughs> we wow. like to bring it up when we can and name drop it where, wherever we can. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably that's one amazing. of the coolest things I've ever done. So that I, um, yeah. <laughs> How did you get onto that? Um, so as I say, one of the, one of the hats I wear is like as a session musician in different capacities. So as a singer, but also orchestrator and arranger and, you know, and I play different instruments and song, sometimes write music for film and TV and that kind of thing as well. Um, but so, yeah, uh, because of that, I've worked with a lot of orchestras. And so I've, I've worked with um, an orchestra called the LCA, L London Contemporary Orchestra. And I was asked to, to sing and also book some other singers for this top secret session. We had no idea what it was. Um, and I was like sent a few scores and I was like looking at the titles and I started like Googling them and I was like, 
I was just trying to guess who this could be, you know, yeah, like I didn't, I didn't have any clue. Anyway, <laughs> I, we turned up on the day and it was like, you know, I kind of see Tom York walking by me and I'm thinking, and I kind of do a double take and I'm like, maybe he's on a different session. And then I walk into the room and then it's Johnny Greenwood and I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> what the hell is this? I was so starstruck. <laughs> I was just like, ah, oh. and I, then I made the mistake, of course, of like sitting next to somebody in the, in the control room and I was like, oh, so how are you involved? And he was like, oh, well, I'm the drummer. I'm like, oh God, <laughs> I just didn't recognize you. Sorry. <laughs> so embarrassing. That's hilarious. A <laughs> oh, way to put my foot in it again. Fault. He's always hiding behind a drum kit. <laughs> right? I mean, I, and they did change drummer as well. So that in my defense, but no, he said he's used to it. And actually, I think, I think a lot of, well, I'm not sure if he, he, I don't know. I'm not sure if he minded or if he was just being polite, but I, think, I, love, I, I love the idea of being in a, in a really famous band, but being anonymous in that band. Like how cool is that? That like you can have all the, the good stuff of the success, but without the kind of like not being able to go to the shops, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It seems like an ideal situation to me, but, but yeah. anyway, so, um, so that was cool. That's when we met Carrie Anne and I. And so we um, then we started doing other things. Like I, I had another session uh, for Burberry. It was like a fashion week thing. And I got her involved and she sang on that. And I heard her sing more because I didn't really hear her that much in the Radiohead thing. But basically, you know, she's got an amazing range, incredible, versatile voice. And like, and we started doing some singing and, and, and uh, playing together because we realized we were both also singer songwriters as well as session musicians, you know, so we kind of realized that about each other and started doing gigs. And, um, you know, so she started singing in my band a bit and then she got me to sing on her stuff. And then the thing that, that started the Herd Collective, because that's the name of the female collective, um, uh, was, I suppose, I think because we'd, we'd both been in those situations in, in studios where we were kind of a female in this, those scenarios and mostly dealing with um, kind of male authority figures and like, and our kind of role models around that area. We didn't really see any women who were in sort of producer roles or engineer roles or kind of the, the musical director or the conductors or the, you know, there were no females in that kind of scenario. And we were, you know, as singers, we were kind of like, kind of low on the kind of low on the the kind of power roles or whatever you know so and often you know would be kind of not necessarily respected in terms of our opinion or you know and and so I think um we kind of had 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 that frustration but we also from the live world you know being you know artists gigging we often found that females were kind of quite low like there was low percentage of females and lineups on these festival bills and and various gigs and so we just kind of kept seeing that there was like a kind of lack of female representation and we started looking into it and saw the statistics were quite poor for you know like just from the 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 um studio point of view like mm -hmm. uh two percent of all sound engineers are female one percent of all producers like music producers are female like no insanely low and then that yeah and then actually for you know for artists as well and songwriters like i think it's something like six percent of the of the kind of top 40 chart music is written by women so six percent and really? then i think in terms of the registered songwriters and composers in prs i think it was something like 14 percent a couple of years ago when we started this and then it's gone up slightly but only a few percent of course because it takes a while but mm. but like those are really low numbers for like the fact that we make up 50% or more slightly of the population of the world. And it feels, it felt like a strange thing that music, which is so universal, wasn't being, we weren't experiencing music from an equal amount of the population in terms of gender and, and, well, and other minorities too, but that's another, that's another topic. Yeah. Um, so obviously we're not minority as, as women, but I mean, when I say men, I just mean underrepresented, you know. I know what you mean. Um, and so, so we kind of wanted to do something about that in our own way. So we started, so the, the Herd Collective came from two, for, for, like, I came about with two goals, I suppose. One was to try and do something about that, that percentage shift. You know, we wanted to try and make, you know, try and make more room for opportunities for women in music, whether that was live or in the studio and, and that kind of thing mm. um but another was actually just for the love of collaboration and love of working with other women and 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 creating projects together so um we kind of we found that we always could add a lot to each other's music by singing and playing on each other's songs and and it was quite a fun format for a live concert because people could sort of you could have like a, a kind of tapas style thing where you have different songs from different people and 
you know and it's so you kind of it's quite varied as a, as from the audience point of view and also because every time we have different people on the lineup so we have different features of guests and and uh and so it's kind of it keeps it interesting as a, you know as a band of musicians it's always changing it's always adapting and always evolving and always growing so like you know we started off with one cellist who was joining us Midori Jaeger who's a brilliant cellist and singer songwriter and then we we grew from three to like 30 to like I don't know how many we have now but like it's um we have quite a lot of people we've collaborated with now over the years or two years and uh so yeah you know that, that was a, a kind of long-winded explanation but that that is uh, something that we're I'm really proud of you know I've been part of and um, I'm hoping that we can continue to to grow and we've been doing more online of course with you know the fact that we can't be doing our usual gigs uh, in person yeah. so we've done a weekly live stream now for the past couple of months and wow. uh, on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m if you'll have to send me a link and I'll have to stick it in the description so we can yeah. watch yeah. Definitely, and each each week features different people, so it's always it's always varied. And you know, we take requests, and it's it's a lot of chat as well. So we we interview each other a bit, and we have like quick fire rounds, and you know, that kind of <laughs> stuff. And we like review drinks and things like that. It's, it's quite fun. So uh, yeah, come and join us. Like fun. Yeah, no, I'd love yeah. to. If you can send the link, yeah. I'll make sure I stick it in the description so people can come Definitely. and watch. But that'd be amazing. Um, and yeah. I know that you've got to disappear soon, but there's something I just want to ask you. Before. Oh God, yeah. Time. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just, with the Herd Creative, I love the idea that it is so versatile. And I mm. love that you're versatile as well, because I've had people say to me in my career, you need to narrow down on a niche so mm -hmm. that people can put you in a box. Right. So people can put you in a pigeonhole. They know what they, you are. They know where to put you. They know where to find you. Yeah. And I know that there are arguments for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never quite been able to do that. And I described it me on my too. social media a little while ago where I said, that there's a quote on the back of one of my grandmother's old singing books that I love. Mm. And that is that the voice is, has the ability to paint in sound the color of human emotions. Mm. And that's one of my favorite quotes. And I thought, well, if, if the voice has that power to paint in sound all these different human emotions, why should I put mine in a box? And what emotion am I going to focus on? Mm -hmm. um, so I've always fought against that and tried to be versatile and do what I want um, and so I'd love to know what your thoughts are on versatility being so mm. versatile yourself do you feel like it's a great thing to be versatile or do you feel like it has held you back in some way mm. well it's hard to know you know and a parallel universe of when you know if you'd made that choice to just do this one thing and only that yeah. would it be different to be honest I don't want it to be different I I would I think that you know you, I think you, if you just follow your instinct with it and, and follow your own emotion, you will you will find the answer. That sounds so fucking cheesy. Sorry, <laughs> I just swore, didn't I? <laughs> Oops. Um, maybe you can cut that bit out. <laughs> um, <clears throat> maybe I'll ask the question again and I'll, I'll answer it. <laughs> oh gosh, sorry. Okay, oh, I'm just gonna say because it it's all authentic. Keep it in. Okay. <laughs> I said fricking, okay? I didn't say anything. Yeah, else. I know, like chicken. Yeah, um, exactly. yeah fricking chicken. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <Fine>. So, <laughs> so yes, it um, might be cheesy, but I do think that if you follow your instinct with this stuff, then um, you will find, you know, the right thing for you, whether, whether that is focusing on one thing. Like, I'm, that, I think a lot of people do that and they do it well and that's brilliant. Um, I personally, I, if I had an ideal restaurant, it would be a tapas restaurant because I love the variety of life. I love... I love challenges. I love, I like, I, I like stimulation. Like I'm an extrovert and I like being stimulated with lots of different projects and different yeah. collaborations and challenges and learning opportunities. So that that's in my nature and my personality. And I think I've tried to deny that a lot in the past. And instead I think it's better just to embrace it and just to, and to figure out a way through that. So, but because of that, I, I have to say, I owe a lot of my, you know, my ability to stay in the music world through these different changes, um, to the fact that I have been versatile and been willing to learn and adapt and, and desirous to, you know, like I want to, I, I enjoy those challenges. So because of that, I've now been able to, you know, survive as a musician, as a session player, but also as a, um, as a performer and songwriter and as a, you know, a, like a, as somebody who's organizing uh, like a collective and all the various things that goes into that, um, that go into that. And, and, you know, also as an educator, I, I also teach and do workshops as well and that kind of thing. So I, I love that I, 
uh, I, I love that variety in my life. And, and I think if I didn't have those skills in those different worlds, then it, w- it would be pretty hard for me to survive actually in this industry because as an independent artist, as you know, it's hard to, to kind of guarantee any kind of regular income. Um, I mean, could I, could I be better at doing certain things to, to enable that, like, that flow of income with just one thing like yes I could like just focus on uh, the artist thing and I could sort of do a lot more to like I don't know to to kind of get my business in order I suppose and like you know build the online thing and and, you know maybe have more merch available maybe maybe kind of um I don't know I maybe I could probably do more and and but I I don't know I, I I just I feel like whenever I choose to do one thing over another then I'm not being true to to myself really because I actually what I love is to do lots of different things so I think if I I don't know that would be I'm not sure if I'm I'm, I'm concluding this very easily but or very clearly yeah but I think that that's uh, but at the same time like if you know if things come along you know that are that that do feel right and do feel like the thing to do then I'm I'm very happy to go down that path a little bit and to maybe prioritize a little bit for a short while or whatever um and i, I think but I, i'm just going with the flow with it, with it a little bit and, and seeing where where their opportunities arise and where the interest is and where people are responding to stuff you know so i think being flexible to that and being you know like a river rather than being like a rock you know <laughs> like i i very much want to be in the flow of things and to and to respond and adapt according to every day and all the new things. And this is why I think maybe this period has, has not been that hard for me in, in some ways because I'm so used to adapting. So like having had a diary full of concerts, festivals, I was going to play Glastonbury, Fe- sorry, I shouldn't say that because I wasn't supposed to announce it, but I'm gonna, I was going to play a lot of big festivals this summer and lots of really fun things and touring. And I had a great, you know, a great summer planned and, and you know, all the months before and after as well. But I am... Um, but because this obviously this has all been cancelled, I I think I it was maybe quicker than most to kind of get to kind of change mindset and just sort of adapt and, and figure out ways of, of still being able to express myself and write and do music and stay in touch with people and just find new ways to do that, you know. And yeah. I I think because I've was I've been so used to adapting, that's probably it's easier for me to do to do this kind of change, you know. So Yeah, and all the while being authentic and being your true authentic self which is yeah. I think probably one of the really important things um that we've discussed in this yeah. <laughs> in this podcast yeah. chat yeah being true Definitely. to yourself throughout the whole thing which you're right does sound a bit cheesy but um <laughs> true because then people mm. like they're able to identify with you more as well they're able to connect with you more when you are doing things that are your true authentic self so yeah that makes a lot of sense I really like that answer it's nice to hear mm. that it's really benefiting you um, cause I know what you mean about focusing on the one thing, but then as a self-employed independent musician, it's really scary to then put all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> yeah. It's just from a business point of view, you're, yeah, you're kind of, you know, you're potentially, there's a higher risk as well, but yeah. I think that that's very much a fear based reason rather than like a, a love based reason, you know, like that, that's a fear of, of failure, right. Rather than actually an enjoyment of, of like what it is you're getting from it rather than what you're not you know what I mean so yeah, I feel like right. or a fear that's one thing's going to be taken away so you're like oh, yeah. sugar, I've got to go and do this and that and the other just well yeah and like that and that's fine that can be a motivating factor and you know that's okay and I and I definitely have felt that fear too like I've felt like scared if I say no to something that oh yeah. my god will I ever work again you know you, yeah. you get, you get, you're going to go into these these fear-based kind of decisions a bit but yep. but actually I think I, I think I feel better when I think about it uh, a bit more and I think actually do I, you know, given these choices, what do I actually enjoy? What would I enjoy doing more uh, rather than what am I scared of missing out on? If I, you know, like, yeah. I think, but it's really hard to answer those questions and even to ask those questions to begin with, because, you know, you go into kind of default mode or you go into fear mode or whatever. And, mm. um, and maybe those are not the best places to, to kind of properly make a decision <laughs> I yeah. Don't know. yeah I know exactly what you're saying you're completely right um but I'm also concerned about the time because I think you've yes. got to disappear <laughs> <laughs> I know <laughs> you've asked so much of your time thank you so much oh, no sorry for blabbering on I as I said I could talk forever if you if you let me <laughs> well yeah I would let you <laughs> very interesting <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, I'm still figuring out so much stuff like I I figure out stuff by talking about it to be honest so like I wish I had clear answers sometimes but sometimes you do have to go down that little you know circuitous route to get to what you really mean I yeah. think yeah and to get your it wasn't boring for people head. 
that's what I do yeah. Yeah, Rich is my sounding board. I'm not yeah. completely sure that he listens all the time, but as long as I can talk at him, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, that's great. Yeah. That's, that's Yeah, we all need that, I think. I'm definitely, I, that's how I work out my thoughts as well. Or, you know, or sometimes I used to write a diary a bit more, but to be honest, talking is quicker. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You need a voice diary, a captain's diary, like the car. Yeah. The, oh, I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love it. Anyway. Star Trek reference. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so love talking to you. We'll have yeah, to you too. Soon. I'd love that. Absolutely. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah, friends trivia pursuit. That one. Yes, let's friends. do that. That'd be fun. <laughs> we should do that. <laughs> Thank you okay. so much, Daisy. Love. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.